Good afternoon. We are going to start now with this afternoon's session and essentially we have uh, experts on evidence with incredible research behind them and you know them very well. To my right now, I have Professor Hoho Knai. He comes from the National University of Singapore and he's Somebody who, well, uh, studied at Oxford and then went on to a PhD at Cambridge. So he's been a student of the two best British universities, with all my respects, of course, for all other universities in the world. And among his most important publications, we have the criminal trial, the rule of law, the exclusion of lawfully obtained evidence. So possibly one of the most recent, 2016, but then after, and specifically very interesting for what he's going to be talking about here this afternoon, we have his book on the presumption of innocence as a human right. And I was also interested in reading about two books of his with such, well, the titles that I'm sure you'll remember. One is Law, Virtue, and Justice. So Law, Virtue, and Justice. And it really is well worthwhile. It's very good reading. And another book of his, which is, uh, well, uh, a really incredible reference and that should have been part of uh, probatory studies before, Law, Philosophy, Evidence of Law. So we wish we had had these books uh, earlier. He has been kind enough to travel here, and he's come to talk to us about silence, silence as, as evidence. So, Professor Ho Ho Glei, when you like, you can begin. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Nieva, for the introduction. Um, I assume it's a, it was a kind introduction. Um, I don't understand Spanish, so uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I realize that I'm talking to an audience that just had a very long lunch, and it would not be very polite of me to talk for too long. I'll try to keep my speech short. Um, this is a sort of promise that all speakers like to make, but they never keep. <laughs> I'll try to honor my word. Um, my topic is silence as evidence. And the topic lies at the intersection between criminal evidence and criminal procedure. The right to remain silent and against self-incrimination is recognized in some quarters as a human or constitutional right. But the right is not given this exalted status everywhere. Um, indeed, it has its fair share of ardent critics. The existence of this right varies across jurisdiction, and this reflects disagreements about its desirability and significance. I take this opportunity to share with you um, the position and the discourse in Singapore. By position, I mean what the law is and how it got there, and by discourse, I mean how officials talk when they defend or praise the law. And this is in the paper. If I have time, I'll go through this, but if not, I'll skip it. Um, one question that I would like to address is whether the experience in Singapore reveal a distinctly Asian perspective to the right of silence. And this jurisdiction, my home country, Singapore, would be used as a springboard, springboard for broader theoretical reflections on the right in general. And at the general level, this topic uh, provides an apt illustration of the general proposition that um, while evidential reasoning is theoretical, it is legal, legally regulated by rules that are, well, based substantially on practical considerations, including those that are political and ethical. If we want to understand how the law regulates evidential reasoning, we may need to go beyond epistemology. 
So let me begin by clarifying what I mean or what the term right of silence mean. Um, I'm afraid it doesn't have a clear and settled meaning. It is rather a cluster of concepts. And um, in the broader sense, the right of silence would include the privilege against self-incrimination. In theory, this right can have many aspects. And I will concentrate only on the following. And this um, are set out at page two of my paper. The first set of aspects is about silence in the context of police questioning. The second set arises at the trial. And these two sets contains four, four equivalent components. The third aspect cuts across both contexts. So let me begin with the first set. And this relates to the right of silence during police interrogation. In this setting, the first aspect, which I call 1A, is the privilege or liberty of a person under investigation to remain silent or to withhold um, incriminating information. The second aspect, 1B, is the immunity from legal sanctions. For example, should a person choose to exercise the privilege in 1A, um, if the person has this immunity, the person would not be subjected to criminal um, sanctions. The third aspect, 1C, is the negative duty of the police to forbear from interfering with or denying the choice to exercise the privilege in 1A. And this negative duty may be enforced by criminal sanction. For example, at least in Singapore, it is a criminal offence for the police to extort a confession through inflicting grievous hurt. And this negative duty sometimes is enforced uh, through evidential device or devices. One classic example is where a statement is obtained by coercion. Now, that statement would be treated in law as inadmissible. The fourth aspect, 1D, is the positive duty of the police to take measures to protect this freedom of choice. And in some jurisdictions, the police have the positive duty to inform the person, the suspect or the accused, that he or she has this right of silence. Now, in the context of the trial, um, the right of silence has four corresponding components. And the first is the privilege or liberty of an accused person not to testify at the trial. The second is the immunity from legal sanction should he or she exercise this privilege or liberty. The third is the negative duty of the judge to refrain um, from interfering with the choice not to testify. And the fourth is the positive duty to protect this freedom of choice. The third aspect of the right of silence applies to both contexts, as I've said, and this is the immunity from having an adverse comment made to the jury or having an adverse inference drawn by the fact finder from the exercise of the liberty of silence in either 1A or 2A. Now, not all of these aspects of the right of silence exist in Singapore, and I'll not go into the detail. You're probably not that interested um, in what uh, in the detail of Singapore law. Um, but what I want to mention, and this is relevant for my paper, is that the last and the third aspect, the evidential immunity, was removed in 1977. And since then, where a person chooses to withhold information from the police, or chooses to remain silent at the trial, the fact finder has the power to draw adverse inferences from the non-disclosure or from the silence in determining the person's guilt. This is a very wide power. The law says the judge may draw any adverse inference has appear proper. But, I, but this power is not meant to be punitive. It is an epistemic power. It is improper to draw an adverse inference um, simply to punish the accused for being uncooperative or for, being, for not being candid with the authorities. To treat the power as punitive, I think, would be plainly inconsistent with the immunity from legal sanctions, i.e. Um, 2A, sorry, uh, 1B or 2B. 
In principle, the drawing of adverse inferences must be based on epistemic considerations. An adverse inference that P is permissible only to the extent that it is justifiable epistemically in the sense that silence in the circumstances is capable of supporting the belief or the proposition that P. The non-disclosure or silence must be such that it provides good enough basis and there are different interpretations of what counts as good enough. In any case, it must provide good enough basis for drawing a factual inference against the accused that goes some way to support the overall finding that he or she is guilty as charged. Now, how is the accused silence or non-disclosure probative? Analysis of its probative value will have to rest on some general theory of evidential reasoning. Some contend that evidential reasoning um, in the legal context um, is uh, atomistic and probabilistic. Others believe that it is holistic explanatory comparative. I do not propose to enter into this debate as such. In my paper, I sought only to illustrate how the probative value of silence might fit with a theory of the second type, holistic, um, explanatory, comparative. And a version of that is, of course, advanced by Professor Allen uh, with Professor Pardo and his collaborators. And it's probably very foolish of me to talk about relative plausibility in Professor Allen's presence. Um, but as I've said, I merely wish to illustrate the theory, not to um, analyze it in any great detail. So what is this relative plausibility theory? Well, the claim is that in legal disputes, the fact finder does not reason in the fashion that's portrayed by the um, Bayes, Bayesian probabilistic model. Instead, fact finders engage in generating um, explanations for or hypothesis from the evidence adduced at the trial, right? Generating hypothesis or explanations from the evidence. And this is done perhaps by a process of abductive reasoning or drawing inferences to the best explanation and whatnot. And this competing explanations all hypotheses are compared in the light of the evidence. The comparison is not of a hypothesis with the negation of the hypothesis, where the probability of a hypothesis is compared with the probability of its negation. Instead, the comparison is of one hypothesis with one or more specific alternative hypothesis, which is either advocated by a party or independently constructed by the fact finder. On this approach, the plausibility of, say, X, the factual account of the case that establishes the accuser's guilt, is compared with the plausibility of a hypothesis Y, an alternative account that points to the accuser's innocence, and there may be more than one of such alternative account. To establish the standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt, there must be a plausible explanation of the evidence that includes all the elements of the crime. And additionally, there must be no plausible explanation that is consistent with, or perhaps more accurately, that points to innocence. In my paper, I cited Singapore cases um, that appear to have adopted this approach. Just by way of background, in Singapore, we have an adversarial system um, because we belong to the common law tradition. We do not have a jury. Fact-finding is conducted by a judge. And like virtually all common law jurisdictions, the standard is proved beyond reasonable doubt. And this standard has been interpreted to mean this, and I, I quote, the court cannot be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt on circumstantial evidence unless no other explanation than guilt is reasonably compatible with the circumstance, unquote. And in another case, I'm sorry to the interpreter, this is, this is not in the version that I gave you, but I'll read it out slowly. In another case, the test is whether the cumulative effect of all the evidence leads to the irreversible, sorry, irresistible conclusion 
that it was the accused who committed this crime? Or is there some reasonably possible explanation? For example, was it an accident? Unquote. Now, if you were to take this approach, um, the prosecution's theory would lack sufficient explanatory power where the evidence is also consistent with a different theory that points to the reasonable plausibility of the absence of one or more elements of the crime. And since the accused has an interest in preventing the prosecution from discharging his burden of proof beyond reasonable doubt, he or she has an interest in raising the reasonable possibility or plausibility of some such alternative theory. The defense does not have to prove this theory, but it is insufficient to simply suggest some, and I quote, fanciful or speculative possibilities, unquote. The Court of Appeal has distinguished between a mere doubt and a reasonable doubt. Mere doubt that is not concretely articulated in relation to the evidence in the case, according to the court, may be rejected. Here is where the accuser's silence can be probative. It is probative where it undermines the plausibility of the alternative hypothesis of innocence raised by the defense. And in my paper, I discuss the case of Ole Ko. There, the accused was prosecuted for murder. He was the driver of a school bus. And the victim was one of the students who regularly took his bus. And at the trial, the following circumstantial evidence was adduced. And that evidence established that the victim was last seen alive boarding the bus that looked like the accused's bus. There was no one else in it apart from the two of them. The accused had previously teased and made other upsetting remarks to the victim, including remarks about her body. The accused lied about his bus undergoing repair. In the afternoon on the day the girl went missing, and had asked the mechanic to support his lie. He had also led the police to the spot where the victim's decomposed body was found, and there was expert evidence that certain injuries on the victim were caused by a blow delivered with great force. So in the face of this and other incriminating evidence, the accused elected to remain silent at the trial. He was convicted, and on appeal, the defense counsel argued that the trial judge had mis misapplied the standard of proof because the trial judge, according to defense counsel, had failed to consider the possibility that the victim might have died as a result of being hit by the bus in an accident and that the lies told by the accused could have been told just to disassociate himself from the incident. And this argument, uh, was received by the Court of Appeal, who accepted, which accepted that if it is true, if it, if it were a reasonable hypothesis that the deceased could possibly have died in an accident, the accuser's guilt would not have been proved beyond reasonable doubt. However, and this is the key point, the hypothesis raised by the defense was not a reasonable one. The Court of Appeal emphasized that it is not the duty of the courts to devise and conjecture possible defenses for an accused, particularly when the accused could so easily have explained what actually happened to the deceased." Unquote. So in the case at hand, the silence of the accused is probative and supports the prosecution's theory in this way. It undermined the plausibility of the competing hypothesis raised by the defense. And to flesh out the normative um, value of silence in explanatory terms, I think we may possibly draw on the notion of nomic support, nomic support um, that um, has been developed by a philosopher, uh, Martin Smith. And this was done in the context of um, um, providing a necessary condition for epistemic justification. Now, let us label the accused silence at the trial as evidence E, silence as E. And let us label the competing defense hypothesis as Y. This is the hypothesis that the um, accused had accidentally hit the victim with bus. So, 
on um, this notion of nomic support, E evidence, nomically supports not Y, the falsity of the defense hypothesis, insofar as the circumstance in which E evidence and Y hypothesis are both true requires more explanation than the circumstance in which E is true and Y is false. Now, for Martin Smith, normalcy is not just a uh, matter of statistical generalizations, where normal circumstances are circumstances that frequently obtain, while abnormal circumstances are circumstances that infrequently obtain. For him, that's not the concept of normalcy. And he gave this example. It is highly impossible that I, I will win a fair lottery where I hold just one out of a million ticket. It's highly improbable. But it is not abnormal for me to win the lottery in this sense, that if I do win, I will not look, go look for some special explanation for winning. It just so happened that my ticket was the winning ticket and it could have been any of the other tickets. Silence is evidence that calls for explanation. And the explanation will have to rest not well, unlikely to rest on statistical generalizations. The generalizations will probably be of the sort um, described by L. Jonathan Cohen in his classic book. And he says this, the generalizations are not statable as exact and fully determinate correlations. They function instead as common sense presumptions which state what is normally to be expected but are rebuttable in their applications to a particular situation if it can be shown to be abnormal in some relevant respect." Unquote. So given our general beliefs about the world, including human psychology, we may think that in the circumstance, it is normal for an innocent person to speak rather than remain silent. And that silence where the accused is factually innocent calls for more explanation than silence where he or she is factually guilty. It is abnormal for an accused person who is in fact innocent to remain silent. Special explanation is called for, and especially so uh, in the circumstances of the case that I just discussed, where the accused's guilt has emerged as a highly plausible explanation of the evidence adduced at the trial, and where the accused alone is in a position to give and can easily give um, evidence in support of the hypothesis that he is relying upon to counteract the prosecution's theory. So in the absence of some special explanation for the accused's silence, silence it nomically supports the falsity of the defense hypothesis. A similar sort of reasoning can apply to pretrial silence. Um, silence during police questioning may undermine the plausibility of the competing hypothesis that the defense raises only at the trial. When an accused person did not disclose facts supporting that hypothesis when he or she was interrogated, the law in Singapore permits the trial court to draw an adverse inference from the non-disclosure. Judges tend to treat pre-trial silence as a phenomenon that begs for explanation. If the facts that the accused now allege in his or her defense are true, why did she or he not mention them earlier on? That is the thinking. So the circumstance of non-disclosure to the police where the defense hypothesis is true requires more explanation than the circumstance of non-disclosure to the police where the defense hypothesis is false. As compared to silence at a trial, nomic support for pre-trial silence um, is easier to defeat. And this is because more innocent explanations are potentially available in the circumstance of pre-trial non-disclosure. For example, the non-disclosure could have been the result of stress or mental disorientation caused by a highly oppressive interrogative environment or plain ignorance about the legal significance of the undisclosed facts. In Singapore, typically, um, persons who are being questioned, there's no access to counsel. 
So, so far I've um, tried to persuade you when clearly you do not need persuading <laughs> that silence can be probative, um, but I've tried to provide some clarity perhaps on how it is probative. So if we accept, as I think we all do, that silence can be probative, why should it not be used as evidence in court? It can be under Singapore law, as I've said. The right of silence in Singapore lacks the third aspect, the immunity from evidential consequences. But then the argument is, does the drawing of an adverse inference from silence violates the accuser's liberty of silence? That is aspect 1A and 2A. In other words, if we remove aspect 3, does that undermine aspect 1A or 2A? And the Privy Council has held it does not because the power to draw an adverse inference from silence does not compel speech. It merely induces the accused to speak. I think the correctness of this reasoning is open to doubt. If we read the privilege to remain silent, um, has the liberty to exclude oneself from being used as a source of evidence in the legal determination of one's guilt. Allowing the trial court to draw an adverse inference from the excise of the privilege will undermine significantly the value of the privilege. One is no longer at full liberty to exclude oneself from being treated as a source of evidence by remaining silent at trial or pre-trial. If silence itself can be treated as a form of self-incriminating evidence, where silence will result in an adverse inference, there is self-incrimination even in silence. So it is arguable that the absence of the immunity in aspect, aspect 3 undermines the value of the privilege in 1A and 2A. Now, unlike in Singapore, some legal systems do recognize the immunity from adverse inferences being drawn from silence. The accuser's silence cannot be used as evidence. It is widely believed that this immunity requires justification because it seems to run against the truth-seeking function of the uh, trial. And there may be epistemic justification for this. Suppose fact finders, um, for various reasons, tend to be overly dismissive of innocent explanations for silence. If so, it may promote fact finding accuracy in the long run by barring the use of silence as incriminating evidence has a rule. I do not know whether this is empirically true in Singapore or elsewhere, and I'm more interested in the second type of justification. And this is a type of justification that draw, draws on practical, either political or moral considerations. I've just suggested that to allow an adverse inference to be drawn is to impair on the liberty to remain silent. If this is right, a possible practical justification for the immunity from adverse inferences is that it serves to uphold the privilege of silence. The strength of this practical justification would depend on whether upholding the privilege of silence through the immunity is worth the sacrifice of silence as a form of probative evidence. In Singapore, the position taken is that it is not worth the sacrifice. As I've mentioned, the immunity was abolished in 1977, and um, the legislative history and the government's rationale um, are discussed in my paper. In gist, in pressing for the amendment, the government's emphasized that the existence of the immunity has resulted in a loss of probative incriminating evidence thus harming the effectiveness of crime control. And it was only much later in the 1990s that the justification, instead of emphasizing crime control, the justification turned in a different direction when the talk began about Asian values. This is noted in my paper, but because Asian value has gone out of fashion, um, I don't propose to go at length into it, um, except to note that this is, we are Asians is no longer a popular idiom in the defense of Singapore criminal process. 
taking its place is an assertion of national sovereignty um, that has an independent nation. The country has the right to craft, to strike the balance in the way um, that reflects the will of the majority and so forth. So the emphasis is no longer explicitly on Asian values, but on the right of a sovereign nation to set her own priorities in her laws. Without going into the details, they are in the paper, let me just summarize the arguments that has been advanced by the state and um, its functionaries. And at the simplest, it is this. The argument is that the vast majority of Singaporeans value security against crime much more than they do individual rights of criminal justice. And on the assumption that they are negatively correlated, this legitimizes the sacrifice to some extent of individual rights for the sake of achieving security. This ordering of priorities reflects values shared by most Singaporeans. As I've said, Asian values are no longer touted, but we come full circle if the common values allegedly shared by Singaporeans are of a distinctly Asian nature, as it was claimed in a white paper adopted by parliament. That is the argument. And I think this argument raises or conceals all sorts of difficult questions at the general level. And I've listed them in my paper, and I'm very happy now to sidestep all those questions. My concern is more specific. Is the discourse on the right of silence in Singapore grounded in a non-liberal perspective? And serving a good launch pad for discussion is the English case of Auer and Connolly. In that case, a police constable questioned a man whom he had spotted behaving suspiciously. And the issue was whether the man had committed the offense of willfully obstructing the constable in the execution of his duty by refusing to answer his questions. The court held that the man had a legal right to silence, and therefore his refusal to answer the questions was not willful. And in a telling passage, Lord Parker said, though every citizen has a moral duty, or if you like, a social duty to assist the police, there is no legal duty to that effect. And indeed, the whole basis of the common law is the right of the individual to refuse to answer questions put to him by persons in authority. Let me repeat the first sentence. Though every citizen has a moral duty of you or if you like, social duty to assist the police, there is no legal duty to that effect. Well, is silence then in immoral or antisocial? And if so, how is the right to silence defensible? The privilege to remain silent would seem to run against ordinary practices of morality. After all, we are taught from young that the right thing to do when we have done wrong is to own up. Confession is good for our moral health and according to some religions, it frees us from our sins. But this criticism obviously needs to be handled with care. Even if confessing to a crime is the morally right thing to do, it does not follow that the law must force suspects to confess their guilt. It is a mistake to read a law that permits a type of action as necessarily encouraging it. A legislation that allows euthanasia, for example, under certain circumstances, is not affirming the principle that the morally right thing for a person to do in those circumstances is to end his or her life. Similarly, in giving the suspect the right not to confess, the law is not thereby promoting silence as the right cause of action. The right of silence gives the suspect the liberty and protects the liberty not to self-incriminate or confess. The right itself provides no reason for the suspect either to remain silent or to disclose his guilt. The, the decision is left to the individual to make. So from a liberal perspective, the right of silence upholds individual freedom. And the freedom in question has been interpreted in moral and political terms. And in my paper, I gave an example of each. A possible moral interpretation proceeds as follows. The right of silence recognizes 
and protects individual freedom in a specific respect, his or her freedom to make an autonomous moral decision on a matter that is of significance to the person's life and identity. In the moral realm, to self-incriminate or confess is not merely to divulge or let slip incriminating facts. It is also about recognizing one's error and accepting responsibility for one's action. It is those qualities, it is these qualities in a confession or associated with confession that pave the way for personal reform. A confession that has this moral value must ultimately be voluntary. It cannot be extracted by command and compulsion. The right of silence ensures that a suspect or accused person has, according to Professor Gernstein, the opportunity to come to terms in his own conscience with the accusation against him. To coerce, to coerce a person into self-condemnation is, he claims, to stultify, stultify his ability sincerely to take responsibility for his actions and to weaken the very capacities for self-evaluation and regeneration that we rely upon for rehabilitation and punishment. So that's the moral interpretation. Now, from a different liberal perspective, the right of silence is, a, is an expression of the political right of individuals to offer resistance against the state. Hobbes, for instance, has argued that no man is bound to confess to a crime, thereby exposing himself to punishment when interrogated by the sovereign or by his authority. Professor Ristrov has offered this reading of Hobbes. In entering into civil society, one exchanges most of one's natural rights on the condition that other individuals will do likewise for the security that only the all-powerful sovereign can provide. If the grant of authority to the sovereign is for the sake of my self-preservation, to protect myself from harm, it must come with the implicit reservation of my right to resist should the sovereign attempt to harm me. The individual's right to resist punishment by the sovereign is not a legally enforceable claim. It is merely a blameless liberty. It simply means that we should not be surprised if the condemned man fights back nor can we say that he's wrong to do so. Since there can be no punishment without a conviction, the right not to confess is a derivative of the right to resist punishment. And unlike the right to resist punishment, the right not to confess, as with other due process rights, is legally enforceable. In refusing to confess, a person is resisting a criminal conviction. Legal recognition of this right to resist whether the person is factually innocent or guilty, or even especially when the person is guilty, is, on this view, a form of respect for the individual. Hobson respect for criminals refuses to blame humans for acting on the fundamental and rational drive for self-preservation. This political justification for the privilege of silence views the criminal process as, and I quote from, I borrow from the words of John Griffiths, the criminal process is a struggle, a stylized war between two contending forces where there's profound and irreconcilable disharmony of interest between the state and the person suspected or accused of a crime. And here I'm reminded by the European concept of equality of arms. The state is interested in putting the suspected criminal in jail for preventive or retributive reasons, whereas the accused is interested in getting acquitted. So that is the liberal perspective, moral and political. Suppose we take a non-liberal, communitarian perspective. The Singapore School of Asian Values, um, grounded Asian values, principally in Confucianism, and at first, Blush, it seems absurd to think that classical Confucianism can have anything to say about legal right that in its time had yet emerged from Western legal history. This is true, but maybe a little too hasty. Confucianism has been interpreted as a variety of virtue ethics and also as a form of role ethics. 
Moral virtues, or the social roles played by human beings, take center stage in the ethical analysis. Suppose we take the standpoint of a virtuous person or social role player who is accused of or questioned about a crime. What will he or she do? Now, ethical theories of the deontological variety put primary emphasis on rules and duties. Consequentialist ethical duties focus on the evaluation of consequences. In contrast, virtue ethics places primary analytical importance on the virtues of the agent and role ethics focuses on interactions among human beings that are defined by the social roles. Human or social flourishing is the way of life of the virtuous person or the social role player. And this may well call for a confession when accused of or questioned about crime. A uh, confession followed by repentance and atonement is likely to contribute to repairing the social relationship that has been disrupted by an anti-social criminal act. This is the perspective that lends itself to what John Griffith calls a family model of the criminal justice system. A criminal process that's modeled on family relations would be based on an assumption of reconcilable, even mutually supportive interests between state and individual. Reconciliation is emphasized. And here I'm reminded of Professor Zhang's lecture yesterday, where he mentioned that one of the aim of his theory of evidence is to promote harmony. So not so much equality of arms, emphasis on harmony. Members of society are perceived as serving roles that come with responsibilities. They are not free, but necessarily and desirably encompassed in an interrelated coexistence that aspire to human and social flourishing. Conversely, if society is but an aggregate of agents who bear rights that protect the inherent and separate claims to freedom and autonomy, individuals should be protected against the state under a battle model of the criminal justice system. Now, all I am suggesting is that Confucianism offers a perspective that differs from the liberal one. I do not suggest that this perspective is available only from Confucianism. Um, other communitarian theories, either from the East or from the West, might well say the same thing. I'm also not suggesting that Confucianism is necessarily against the right of silence. I'm not confident enough to say that. And I think it's probably wrong. In the first place, it is well known that classical Confucianism favors the use of rights and moral ex exemplars over the law as primary sources of guiding social behavior. Confucius himself was skeptical about the ability of laws and punishments to create and or maintain a decent human society. And there's this famous passage from the Analects that's often quoted in this respect. It goes like this. Keep the people orderly with penal law and they will avo avoid punishments, but will be without a sense of shame. Far better to lead by moral example and they will develop a sense of shame and moreover will order themselves. So that's the first point. The second point is this, that Confucianism, whether we see it as a type of virtue ethics or a version of um, role morality, is particularistic. There is no categorical imperative to tell the truth though heavens may fall, nor is the agent guided by a decision procedure that involves some calculation of what would maximize happiness or utility in some way. What virtue or social role calls for depends on the specific context. It is possible that silence is what a virtuous human being would do when questioned by an officer investigating a crime. Relatedly, in a, uh, another passage equally famous in the Analects, Confucius purportedly talked well of a son who covered for his father's crime by lying to the authority. Thirdly, virtue has an emotional component. An unrepentant person can be forced to disclose discrim uh, incriminating facts. But the sort of confession that is associated with repentance is a voluntary one. So in this respect, there's an affinity with the emphasis on freedom on the liberal account that stresses moral autonomy. As I've said, legal recognition of the right to silence um, does not imply, and the liberal account does not claim 
that the morally right thing to do is to remain silent. What it does say is that an individual should be left free to choose whether to confess or to remain silent. While liberty is not itself a basic good, it may be a feature of an environment that is conducive to or needed for human and social flourishing. So the first point about skepticism on the appropriateness of law as a tool for re uh, regulating human behavior suggests that legal compulsion to self-incriminate would be disfavored. It follows from the second point about particularism that the matter cannot be governed by an across-the-board rule. And the third point about voluntariness, voluntariness suggests the desirability of according individuals the freedom to act as the context calls for. So in these three senses, it seems to me that the Confucianist perspective would seem consistent with the right of silence. Legal compulsion to speak cannot be grounded in an ethical theory that does not regard silence as always virtuous and that prefers to have human behavior motivated by an internalized sense of shame than dictated by external compulsion of law. Just to sum up, Silence is probative, and I've tried to explain its probative value in ex explanatory and comparative terms. If silence is probative, why exclude it as evidence? What justification can we have for excluding silence as evidence? Um, a practical justification is that we need to have this immunity in order to uphold the liberty of silence or the privilege of silence. We need aspect three to protect aspect 1a and 2b, uh, 2a. So this pushes the search for justification um, for the immunity to a search of justification for the um, privilege. And while different pictures of the purpose and nature of the criminal process emerge from the liberal and communitarian perspective, it is unclear that they necessarily lead to different conclusions on the privilege. So my discussion has been cautiously tentative, but I hope to have illustrated how legal um, uh, regulation of evidential reasoning might invite engagement with multiple fields, not only with epistemology, but also with political and ethical theories. I've not kept to my promise, but i have not in too great a breach of it either. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ho, for your nice presentation. You can be sure that at the beginning I introduced you in the most proper way, so don't <laughs> yes, worry yes. about that. That was a joke. Was a joke. Okay. So, bien, si hay algunas, seguro que hay algunas preguntas. So, questions. I'm sure there must be questions uh, for this truly delicate subject. We've been on it for years, talking about the Murray Standard, for example, that follows very much the line of what we have been told in this presentation, whether to give uh, or attribute value to silence or not. But I don't want to steal time. And what I would like to ask you all, please, is uh, to make sure that all the questions are, as, well, only one and very straightforward. I wouldn't dare tell you that it should be a tweet with 180 characters, but mm, practically as short. That way, our discussion must be, will be much richer. There's a question over there. Sorry? No, no, no. no. Oh, Excellent ponencia. The Great presentation. This is great. I am Andrea from Colombia. Can you hear me? Yes? Excellent, Professor, excellent. My question regarding silence has to do with human rights. I do agree in that uh, keeping silence is a human right and it should be respected as such and it, would, it should be contemplated as one of the possibilities all over the world. In Colombia, we have the right to retract I would like to know whether in Singapore, a person who accepts the indictment and freely expresses that voluntarily he or she is going to accept the accusation, well, then later on in Singapore, do you have the possibility for that person to retract, to say, no, I, I don't agree, so I don't accept the accusation. What happens there for a person after having accepted that and then to retract? Shall I answer? Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, 
Regarding the first part of your question on um, the right of silence as a human right, um, I'll just note that um, it is not universally recognized. Um, it is not mentioned in the ASEAN um, Human Rights Declaration. It's not there. And in Singapore, we have a court appeal case that has held that the, the, the privilege against self-incrimination is not a fundamental rule of natural justice under our constitution. Under Article 9, fundamental rules of natural justice do have constitutional status. But the um, privilege against self-incrimination is not one of them. So I think there is um, a lot of disagreement, or rather there's no universal recognition that the right of silence is a basic human right as such. Um, now, on the second point about retraction, um, yes, that is, that is possible. Uh, it is possible for um, accused person to retract a confession, and it is then for the court to decide whether what he's saying now is the truth or whether his earlier confession um, is the truth. So um, ultimately, the court has the freedom to reject one or the other. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. Bien, más cuestiones. Otra pregunta por ahí. Aquí. Yes, following uh, the same lines as my colleague before, this, the right to retract, but in the sense of maintaining silence, that is, um, I retract and uh, furthermore, I manifest I am not going to declare. Is that possible or do I have to retract and give a different version necessarily? Well, in Singapore, in Singapore, the, um, the, the person has a right to remain silent. That's aspect 1A. The person has the liberty to remain silent. Um, but this liberty does not carry with it a further um, consequence. You have this liberty to remain silent, but the court at the same time has the power to draw an adverse inference from your silence. Um, so I'm not sure if it is possible to retract your statement and then sort of um, protect yourself from having adverse inferences drawn from your silence. Because under our law, adverse inference can be drawn from your silence. I do not know whether I've understood your question. I'm sorry if I have not. Um... OK. Have you another question back here? Thank you, Professor. I really found your presentation stimulating. I loved reading your text, and every time I read you, the same thing happens. I have three questions, very short. One has to do with the diagnosis that you have at the beginning of your paper, and the other with the substantive thesis about normative justification of the right to remain silent. First, as to diagnosis, I don't know whether I understood correctly, but you let slip the fact that there was a lack of uh, legal acknowledgement of this uh, right to remain silent. And I, I understood that you idealized the reason for this lack of acknowledgement or recognition on the basis of something like uh, non-reflection about the foundations of this right. And that, I think, is rather debatable, because some rights, there are some rights, for example, the right uh, called to acknowledgement of legal personality, that yes, is consecrated in some international charters and so some national charters as well, that has um, a minor problematization or minor reflection. So I don't always get the impression that you have acknowledgement of right and furthermore reflection about the right. They don't always go together. And then about the, the normative um, suggestion or proposal, I why should we or wouldn't it be enough to have the liberal justification of the right to remain silent? Why isn't that enough? Because I get the impression that with a standpoint such as Waldrum and also Rass, one could perfectly well indicate that the individual 
has the right to remain silent because uh, it's part of his uh, most basic decisions and that makes the individual be an autonomous agent and then in that way maintains his uh, autonomy and individual liberty. I'd like to know what the problem is of justifying the right to remain silent in this way. Third question regarding this uh, Confucianism issue. I don't have it very clear whether Confucianism is part of a community standpoint or really and truly is it opening kind of a third approach. So liberalism, communitarism, and then uh, Confucius. Why am I saying this? Because I get the impression that the idea of reconciliation or atonement and um, the fact of somebody, you know, not being happy and, and confessing, well, one could say that these are still items that are very individualistic, very personal of the agent. And so I don't see clearly how it helps the community or how it helps uh, if it's a sphere that goes beyond the person, the individual. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> perhaps let me take the second. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, um, very good questions. On your second point about normative justification, why isn't the liberal justification good enough? Well, I, I'm suppose, I suppose it is good enough for quite, a many, quite, quite many societies. Um, but there are societies that don't take that view. And, and um, well, um, Singapore probably would count as one of them. Um, we have a white paper that stress society above self and so forth, and the emphasis has been that you know um, we are we don't subscribe to liberal ideology. We prefer communitarianism, right? Um, so insofar as liberal liberalism is not the only political theory that's floating around, um, there are others as well. And the question for every society is which political theory that they want to subscribe to. Um, now, Confucianism, you're, you're right, Confucianism has been, a, it is controversial as a political theory, um, but I'm in the main relying on Professor Rossmann's interpretation of Confucianism, where uh, he uses it as a basis for criticizing individualism. And the reason why I latch onto that is because that sort of mirrors um, the discourse that has been taken um, at the official level in Singapore. So instead of just, you know, it's just rubbishing all that's been said in official discourse, if I were to try to take it seriously, then I have to try sincerely to try and find if there is any possible legitimate viewpoint from that perspective. And that was where I discovered Professor Rossmann's um, interpretation of Confucianism. And it does, it seems to me, paint a perfectly legitimate alternative viewpoint. Um, and I'm just going to cop up on this, that there are, I think, alter alternative viewpoints that are equally legitimate. And ultimately, I think Professor Allen made the point yesterday, um, is for each society to decide for itself what um, her priorities should be. Right? Now, if, if you look at, for example, the criminal justice system in Japan, it comes close to the family model. In other words, I mentioned there are two models of criminal justice. One is the battle model, and the other is the family model. And um, I would, I suppose, um, look at the battle model as one that's in line with uh, liberal theories and a family model that's one that's in line with communitarian theories. And if you look at the system in Japan, I'm, I'm not a specialist, but my understanding is that um, the aim is, priority is uh, reconciliation. The charge rate is very low because the aim is not to secure conviction. The aim is to uh, bring about reconciliation. And the ideal case is where the person doesn't go to trial, right? Um, and I was at a conference, and there's a big development on the law on apologies. And the apology law, again, is aimed at um, securing uh, reconciliation. So there you have it. The, the aim is not so much um, a battle where the state and the individuals are pit in some sort of contest, 
um, but where the interests of society and the interests of the individual are not seen as divergent. Right? Reconciliation is good for the individual and good for society. Um, and I think when the, um, Professor Chang mentioned harmony, probably that was um, the, 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 the idea that um, he was expressing. Right? Um, even that answer doesn't satisfy me, so it probably doesn't satisfy you. Um, but that's all I can say, I'm sorry. De acuerdo. Tenemos una pregunta Fine, aquí. we have another question over here. Jordi Ferre has a question. So priority, of course, you are the organizer of this conference. And my congratulations, Professor Ferrer, for this brilliant organization. And thank you, Carmen Vázquez, as well. It's great to have this happening, really and truly. So thank you. And congratulations again. Jordi, you have the floor. Thank you. I really liked your paper. And your presentation, both congratulations online, it's been great. My question has to do with a case that is really on the limbo, really, of your presentation. And that is when it's the legislator who, in some way, is attributing some probatory meaning to the silence of the defendant. This happens, for example, in cases such as uh, uh, illegal uh, enrichment. Yeah, in many systems, this is defined. People with a public post, well, they have been gaining money in an illegal manner, and what they say is more or less as follows. If the person has a heritage, and there is a heritage difference, a substantial difference between the time in which this person started this public job and when the facts are analyzed, and there is a substantial difference in heritage that this person cannot justify either through legal known income, then, and except the contrary is proven, this uh, offense has happened, and then it will be uh, a crime. Of course, this except if the contrary is proven, well, seems to actually place on the defendant the need of not maintaining, not remaining in silence, be it either through his own declaration or through the evidence mm, submitted by the lawyers. But it means that they should not remain in silence. And it's the legislator then who has extracted from this the consequence, the, the, the legal corresponding consequence, that is. If you maintain silence, we declare, yes, that you became illegally rich. So then it's the legislator, really, that through some kind of rule, some legal rule, has extracted this uh, probatory consequence. But what would happen in cases like this, then? What do you think? How does it fit into your scheme? I mean, do you think it fits in? Um, all the other cases or in normal situations that you mentioned, would it fit in there? Or maybe it's not a kind of probatory inference extracted, uh, drawn by the judge, and would it be outside of your analysis? Thank you very much, Jordi. Um, I, I did try to remind myself to thank you and Carmen for inviting me. I, I'm sorry, I completely forgot. But thank you for asking that question. Now, now you give me the opportunity. Um, this is my, my second time in Girona, and I just want to thank you um, sincerely uh, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, on your question, um, now I don't think that the, uh, uh, the power to draw adverse inferences from silence um, that we have in the CPC is um, a means of, in your words, um, attributing probative value to silence. No, I don't think that's, that's how it functions. Uh, the power allows the judge to draw an adverse inference where it is justifiable to draw it, where it is epistemically justifiable. Now, what you have in mind probably is an irrebuttable presumption of law. Oh, sorry, a rebuttable presumption of law. And we have that in Singapore as well. Um, for corruption cases, if, you are, um, if there's evidence that you have received gratification, 
the presumptions of reverses the burden of proof, you have to prove that the gratification was received for an innocent purpose. And you're right, that is a case where the law actually says you have to give probative value to that uh, basic fact, right? From this basic fact, the court is directed to infer the presumed fact. And that is not through the operation of logic or epistemology, that's compelled by law, right? Uh, and you're rightly disturbed by this sort of artificial tinkering with the epistemic inference, right? Because it's not. Um, but the um, constitutionality has been upheld in Singapore. And I think um, to play devil's advocate, one could defend it this way. Well, in the, in the cases, the reasoning is that, well, this is corruption is such a terrible crime. We've got to calm down hard on this type of crime. Therefore, you know, we should make it easier to secure a conviction, which is not much, well, not that legitimate an argument, I think. But perhaps a more legitimate argument would be maybe along the line um, suggested by uh, Duff, Anthony Duff, where he thinks of the criminal process as a uh, a process of calling the accused to account, provided, of course, there is enough evidential basis for calling the accused to account, right? And if there's already, it's been established by evidence that, say, I can't remember the example you gave me, but presumably the person is in possession of a large amount of wealth, um, where perhaps in that circumstance, that circumstance calls for some explanation. And it may be legitimate, I think, for the state to ask for some sort of explanation. But the thing is this, should it only be a legal burden or merely an evidential burden, right? And I think Dove's position is that that, just, uh, that justifies calling on the accused to provide some explanation. But that may not necessarily justify calling upon the accused to disprove the presumed fact. And that, I think, is probably the best position to take. Yes, I think this is a kind of too early assumption, but I'm not here to give my opinion, rather to chair, so I just had to say it, but I'm not happy either. A question over there, I believe. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor. I really liked your presentation. Over here, over here. Yes, on the other side, sorry, over here. I have two very brief questions. The first one is concerning this difference or this distinction you established between the three moments in which uh, there is relevance of the freedom of the right to remain silent, then when there is police investigation during the trial, and then after the possibility of uh, inferring adverse consequences regarding the silence. Three moments. I don't know whether I understood correctly, but um, I understand that you one might conclude that you you maintain that it is possible to, at least during two of the instances, it is possible to defend this right of remaining in silence, but um, according to different types of justifications and taking into account Confucianism, well then, to value in, in some cases, from a more um, particular point of view, the silence. So to give a, a um, probatory value to the silence. Can this decision be maintained, yes, in three moments regarding the justification of silence and the freedom to remain silent, taking into account that in the decision or in the motivation, better said, when one decides whether to remain silent or not, possibly in the context of a penal procedure, Mm, one takes into account especially the consequences, the probatory consequences or, or the probatory value of that silence or in the declaration. So then, said it in simple terms, I find it difficult to see this decision in the different stages if the idea is to mm, preserve this right to remain silent in a, in a criminal context, yeah? And then my second question has to do with what Esteban was saying regarding Confucianism. I really am not familiar with uh, this philosophical theory of Confucius, but um, I didn't really understand it, as my colleague said, 
as a third means of justification. Considering this individualistic moral justification, but could you clarify somewhat what is the counterbalance of Confucianism regarding just individual or individualistic justifications like the ones you mentioned, moral or, pol or political? Is it then community type or is it uh, kind of very much based on particularity or the individual only? Thank you. Yes. Um, in my paper, I look at the um, right of silence in two contexts. Uh, one was in the context of police interrogation. The other is in the context of the trial. And of course, the privilege against self-incrimination can have application in many other contexts. Uh, but I focus only on those two. Um, and I set out this framework, um, not, not so much framework, um, but I try to dissect um, the right of silence into its composite components, if you like. And um, I use more or less the Hoffelian scheme, um, where a right can be interpreted as having all these components. So um, the, the most important aspect of the right would be the privilege to remain silent, the liberty to remain silent. So if you remain silent, well, you are not in violation of the right of others, and you have no duty to speak. That's what it means. Now, aspect B and C, uh, sorry, aspect B, the immunity from legal sanction, is, um, refers to um, the um, non, well, well, essentially it's a way of protecting the privilege, right? If you are truly to have the privilege to remain silent, it doesn't make sense to say you can be punished if you choose to remain silent. So logically, it follows that it has to have this additional aspect. And C and D are about duties on the part of the police or the trial judge. One is positive, the other is negative. And again, it's related to the privilege. Right? Um, so there are aspects, different aspects of one right. The, the focus of my talk was on the last aspect, which is the evidential immunity. And the one argument that's been made is that, well, look, um, adverse comment on silence or adverse inference from silence, there's no big deal. We're not taking away your liberty to remain silent. You can choose to remain silent. We will not punish you if you remain silent, right? But why should we be stopped from using your silence as evidence? And some writers take the view that this doesn't infringe the presumption of innocence because we are not presuming your innocence. We are using your silence as evidence to establish your guilt. So um, that's why I've placed adverse inference as a third aspect that cuts across both contexts. Um, now, on the point about Confucianism, um, I don't think I'm using it as a justification for the right of silence. Um, the reason why I refer to it because um, Sometimes it is said that you know, if, we, if we take a more communitarian approach, if we place society above the self and so forth, and that has sometimes be used, has been used as an argument for diluting individual rights. And I suppose what I'm saying is that Confucianism doesn't necessarily um, suggest that we should not have a right of silence. So my thesis is a negative one, not a positive one. Right? Uh, but I must confess I'm not a Confucian scholar. I, as I've said, I've relied on secondary literature. And some might not treat Confucianism at all as a form of political theory. Right? So um, I'm somewhat speculative on this point. Right? Okay. Otra por ahí. My question has to do with the defendant as a witness for the defense. So once in the oral trial, the defendant has uh, finished answering the questions that uh, the attorney or the lawyer uh, are asking, and obviously now the 
prosecutor wants to ask as well, and now the defendant says uh, he or she has a right to remain silent. So then what about this? Because I think it's a problem uh, with different multiple answers in every different legal system. I would like to know what your opinion is, and could you tell us how you solve it in Singapore? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, don't quite understand the question. Um, can you try to explain it again? Perdón, ¿me puedes repetir? No tenías. Sí, no, 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 que si puedes repetir la pregunta que no te he entendido bien. Ok. Yes, my question has to do with the defendant as a witness of the defense. When the defense is offering as evidence what the the client is saying. So once the, the lawyer of the defendant has ended uh, the questions, well then the, the prosecutor will want to ask the defendant. And then the defendant says that uh, he has the right to remain silent. What about the evidence then? And my question is, what do you think about this and what happens in Singapore? Right, thank, thank you very much. And now, now I understand the question, thank you. Um, well, in Singapore, the position is that the prosecution will start first. And the prosecution has to adduce evidence that establishes a case to answer. At that point, and only at that point, would the accused be asked to elect whether to testify or remain silent. And if the accused chooses to testify, the accused um, will have to be exposed to cross-examination by the prosecution. Right? So the accused cannot um, choose to testify, and then when it comes to the prosecution's turn to question him, claim the right of silence. That, that is not possible. Is it, is it possible in your system? It is? Oh, okay. That's, that's new to me. Oh. Muy bien. That's Tenemos tiempo para, para una última pregunta. We don't have time for our last question, or yes, yes, the Oscar goes too. Thank you. Um, I'm quite sympathetic to the, uh, the paper. But I think one of the issues is that uh, silence is quite blunt or can be blind. So I'm interested in if you have any kind of comment or reflections on um, when an accused or defendant is innocent, a whole range of inferences are still available in relation to silence, and yet that's not in reality probative. I think if you consider a lot of the cases, consider the accused guilty and go from that perspective, but if the accused was innocent, the inferences are still there, and do you have anything to say about that? Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much, Gary, for the um, question. I think back to the basic point, which is that silence can be probative, but not that silence is always probative. And you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes silence uh, is not probative in the sense that there can be um, innocent explanation for the silence. So really, it's silence in the circumstance that we need to consider. In a case, for example, that I discussed, it was silence in the face of a great amount of highly incriminating evidence. Now, in those circumstances, if you still choose to remain silent, well, that is abnormal in a sense um, as uh, defined uh, by Martin Smith, right? In a sense that, well, some explanation is called for, right? Um, but for, for example, if you just come up to me and, and accuse me of something, there might, my silence may not be probative at all because I could simply take the position that I have no duty to answer your accusation. So it all depends on the context, right? Um, but the fear is that judges may um, put too much store, read too much into silence. And that goes to the epistemic just, possible epistemic justification that I mentioned. It could be that it's precisely because judges or lay persons tend to be overly dismissive of possible innocent explanation for silence that maybe it promotes accuracy to prevent its use as a rule across the board, maybe. Yeah. But that then is an empirical question. I do not know whether that is in fact true. Uh, but reading some of the cases where <laughs> courts tend to be highly dismissive of claims made by the accused about how the person was coerced into making a statement. I, I, you do get a sense that courts are somewhat dismissive mm -hmm. of explanations. Mm -hmm. So there could well be epistemic justification. 
So my, my paper is exploratory in, in a way, trying to find out possible justification. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Want? Thank you very much indeed. And now, a big round. Thank you, Professor Fakla.